for people who are just tuning in, we've got Dr. Chris Piaton, a friend, a little physical therapist here in Santa Barbara. Chris and I had the opportunity to talk the other day over coffee, and I was just like, we have to do a podcast. Yeah. Because there's so much I don't know about, yeah, <laughs> which means other practitioners don't and patients. And you started like us as an orthopedic and sports physical therapist. I know there's still a lot of orthopedics in I what you do. Am. You're still an orthopedic, yeah. Yeah. But now you're also a public health physical therapist, and I think yeah. this is such a cool, oftentimes this is called women's health physical therapy, and we were talking about before. Yeah. There's a lot of guys who have public public health issues too, yeah. so um, just excited to get you in and kind of hear about what is a pelvic health physical therapist and what are reasons you might see someone like you, because I think uh, there's just so many people in the public who have no idea this even exists. Totally. And like you're alluding to, I think they just have to live with certain types of symptoms, so... Yeah. Can you give a little bit of a, I remember you talking when we were meeting the other day, starting out in kind of traditional orthopedics and yeah. that transition to where you're at now. What yeah. sparked that and what happened there? Yeah. So to your point, I started out as a sport and orthopedic PT. I always kind of knew that going through PT school, just loved being able to help people in that way. I'm a very athletic human as it is, love running, cycling, beach volleyball, et cetera. So love being able to help people who were excited and wanting to continue their, you know, athletic endeavors across their lifespan. So when I first started out of school, my first year, I kind of put myself in the lane of the the running specialist at the clinic I was working at because none of the other PTs liked the runners. They're like, oh, those are like the crazy ones. And I'm like, give me those. I love those. Um, so I was, was that kind of lane. And my a number of my female runners you know, graduated from PT with me and then started to cycle back after having babies and realizing that they were trying to get back to running and it wasn't feeling good. And they were having a lot of issues feeling comfortable in their body, a lot of hip pain, back pain, all of these things. And so they were actually the ones that sparked my career and trajectory shifting into pelvic health at that point, which felt like an accident, but it was like the best mistake ever that happened to me. And I will always be appreciative to them. But basically, the the accident was that I used the typical kind of return to run protocol that all of us sport and orthopedic PTs sort of, you know, understand of how we work somebody back up to that type of activity. And I started to notice very quickly with my patient population that half of them were responding well to that and the other half were not. And it was not a product of them not putting in the work or us being thoughtful of how to grade them back into it. There was clearly some other variable that was making these two groups split. And I didn't know what that was. So, of course, I consulted Google and I go down the rabbit mm -hmm. holes and I'm like, what the heck is this? And I figure out my hypothesis of, oh, I think this might be a pelvic floor issue. And I kind of pull off, you know, a, a literature review that has a couple questions to ask. And they're like super intimate questions like, hey, are you, you know, do, do you have any leaking with activity? You know, either urinary or fecal. Do you, you know, have any pain with intimacy? Do you have any tailbone pain or difficulty with, you know, fully emptying your bladder or constipation or all these things? I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to have to ask them these very, like, personal questions. I don't know how I feel about this, but I'm also at a loss. Like, I don't know why this isn't working. So I remember printing off the questions because we're in a big open orthopedic gym all of our treatment tables are like right next to each other. And I'm like, how do I ask these intimate questions without also making them feel super uncomfortable and all these things, right? So bless my patients for trusting me and already kind of having a relationship with most of them to be like, hey, so clearly we like something's not working here and I'm really trying to figure out what that is. And these questions might feel like really intimate. And so if you don't feel comfortable answering them, like please know that you don't have to. But I'm suspicious that we might have a pelvic floor problem. And can you look at these questions and... Do, do any of these land for you? And very quickly, all of them were like, yep, 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 yep. And I'm wow. like, okay. So I was like, great. We kind of know that something else needs to be helped. And now my new problem is that I don't have the training to solve this problem. So of course I go back to Google and I'm like, all right, so pelvic floor PT is near me. And there's nothing. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'm like, okay. So now what do I do? Like, I don't know how to solve this problem. I've identified the problem, but now, like, how am I supposed to direct these patients to the next person to be able to help them? I don't feel good just being like, sorry. And so I remember telling my patients, like, look, I, I, I'm, I don't know what we're going to do here, but, like, can you give me a little bit of time? I'm going to do some research. I'm going to try to figure out what this is. And 
through that, I learned that there is a pelvic floor and pelvic health, basically, beginning level course that I can take that is happening six weeks from the date that I'm Googling. And I'm like, all right, thanks, universe. Picking up on the message. I'm going to go enroll in this course still with zero plan to become a pelvic health PT. I signed up being like, I want to figure out solutions. I want to know how to better screen for this so that I don't repeat this same problem with future patients. And also hopefully be able to figure out how do I find a provider to refer to? That was literally my plan. Yeah. Thinking I'm just going to refer to find someone to refer to. Yeah. Yeah. Learn about it and have someone to refer to. Yeah. Because I also was like, oh my gosh, the idea of doing like an internal pelvic floor exam and all that, like I do sports and orthopedics. Mm -hmm. That's a big change to. Yeah. It's intimidating. As well as I didn't even feel comfortable saying the words vulva, vagina, penis out loud without like kind of like cringing or feeling like, oh my gosh, am I allowed to say those words? Now it's just like an elbow or a knee, which I would love everyone to get to that comfort level. But that's how I felt at that time. So the idea of shifting my career to consider that part and have that be part of my toolbox was not what I thought would be my path. But now I can't even imagine not having that skill set. But at this point in my career, I can now appreciate that pelvic health is not separate from sports and orthopedics because our pelvic health is an integral piece of our core team of our body to be able to move well. And so if we don't have a pelvic floor that is operating optimally, then we're not going to be able to move well, as well as we're not going to be able to control bowel and bladder function well. Sexual health is not going to be well. And then other challenges that come up with pregnancy and birth also create a lot of unique challenges to the pelvic floor too. So as I'm in my pelvic floor PT course for the first time ever, we have to do pelvic exams on each other. We did them within the first three hours of the lecture. So you were doing them in the lab? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it was like, Like introduce yourself to the person next to you. I had just had like two hours of lecture. I'm like, cool. Still drinking my coffee. Still kind of waking up. Introduce ourselves. And our instructor was like, okay, so you guys are going to partner up. You're going to do internal exams with each other. And I was like, OMG. So yeah, we got comfy real quick. Real quick. Oh my goodness. Right? And after that course, I left that four-day course being like, oh my gosh, I have to treat this. We don't have enough clinicians. There's not enough people who feel comfortable or willing to, to support this area of the body to have these conversations. I was like, I still don't feel comfortable, but I'll figure it out. Um, and started to say, hey, I'm going to go down this path of continuing education to build upon this, to start to weave it into my practice to be able to help my current patients, as well as realizing the huge kind of provider desert that was around me at the time. Mm. And that was back in 2014 for context. Okay. So. It makes me feel like just listening to you talk about this more and more that it's something I need to, because you're right, it's a part of the body that's kind of neglected by most ortho PTs. And it makes me feel like I should just learn more about it myself. I don't know if I can go to a course and do the actual lab portion. It freaks me out. Yeah. You just teach me the, give me the cliff notes or something. But I feel like it's something, it is so strange to think about this part of the body that is part of orthopedics, has muscles. 100%. Pelvic bone, like all this stuff that's just kind of, it's interesting how there are sometimes there are certain areas of the body that just sort of get ignored a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Lost over. So it makes me feel like I should learn more about this every time I talk to him like I should just do my own research even for the patients I'm seeing I mean I was just telling you a story about a guy who had hip surgery and labor repairs on both sides yeah a long history of these kind of chronic low back pain symptoms that were totally. unpredictable came out of nowhere and I just had this gut intuition because of some of our training um in kind of the deep stabilizers of the spine I was like yeah I wonder if this has a pelvic floor component. I ended up referring him to someone. It was really helpful to him, but yeah. it was getting into all these things that had been totally, he'd been to so many medical practices, other ortho clinics, right. and nobody had ever looked at his pelvic floor. Yeah. And I think that was the missing link. So I'm, I'm confident that it is, it is a piece of the puzzle. I mean, as PTs, I always think about the fact of, you know, when I was in school, we're talking about differential diagnosis and If we're having shoulder pain, right, we need to be able to make sure that is it actually coming from the shoulder or is it coming from the neck because of their crossover, right? I look at differential diagnosis around a hip or a low back as we need to be ruling in or ruling out a pelvic floor component because of their neighboring areas and also because of the crossover of communication between the nerves, muscles, and soft tissue. Yeah. It is no different. Mm -hmm. But I understand the lack of education in our medical training, both as PTs and think about we're we're supposed to be the muscle experts. Mm -hmm. 
So if anybody's supposed to know about this, I argue, we should at least have a surface level understanding to be able to screen coming out of PT school. That is what I would love to propose yeah. to our profession. I'm not expecting people to be ready and willing and desiring to do an internal exam. But I do think that we should have just as much of an understanding to know how to screen these things, especially when we're having patients come in with hip or low back discomfort, mm -hmm. because it is absolutely related. Yeah, just to be new, what symptoms to pick up on. I mean, what are... Yeah. Because it sounds like I would imagine there are some different symptoms between males and females. I know in your practice you're seeing females, yeah. but what are some symptoms people... Yeah. Oh, you mentioned some like the leaking, whether... Mm -hmm. um, Urinary yeah. or fecal. Yeah. So if we're having yeah. challenges with bowel or bladder control, absolutely pelvic floor needs to be ruled out. If we're having any pain throughout that entire kind of lower area between your sits bones and spanning from your pubic bone to your tailbone, anywhere in that region can be a pelvic floor problem. If we're having any chronic kind of tailbone pain or discomfort, as well as kind of around the sacrum and low back, absolutely likely has a pelvic floor component. Even kind of the bucket diagnoses in the orthopedic world of like SI joint pain, you know, piriformis syndrome. Um, all the Cossacks pain yeah, stuff, I'd imagine. all of yeah. that. Yep. Even people that are complaining of like really tight hip flexor or groin symptoms, I go, we need to make sure that that's actually not just a referral from the pelvic floor. There's a lot of crossover between the sacral nerves, the lumbar spine nerves, and the pudendal nerve that are all innervating and supplying communication to the pelvic floor as well as the low back and the hip muscles. So all of this is in the same bucket to me in terms of whenever I have a patient coming in, saying that they have any symptoms in this area, I'm like, I got to check all those boxes to rule in and rule out what I think is actually driving the problem or driving that symptom. Well, it's like they always talk about it. You know, I remember in PT school, there was, in pain, you always talk about if a pain is out really far distal, like if it's your hand or your foot, it's usually, if it hurts there, it's usually something close to that. But as you get closer to the spine, all of these nerves are converging and things yeah. can mimic each other. And it gets talked about in the hip all the time. I mean, things like labral tears and um, l referral from the lumbar spine. You could have different tendinopathies and they can oh. all create, kind of mimic each other and create similar symptoms. So it seems like right. uh, duh, the pelvic floor right there and mm -hmm. probably could create a lot of those symptoms. You could be like, oh, this is just SI joint pain or right. this is a hip joint pain or something. And it's a whole nother deep subset of muscles that we kind of ignore. It's like we're all thinking about glute med and glute max and maybe like Which some of the deeper to, totally but totally. they're not the end all those are like really deep there's those deeper layers that yeah. are just like eh, i don't have anything for that totally so those kind of so was it when you were thinking about transitioning was it mainly that that it sounds like some of it was that in the standard orthopedic kind of intake yeah. those questions just aren't a part of it so people just aren't going to bring them up because it's kind of Right. It's a little, probably feels awkward to bring that up with a PT if they're not asking you about it. I mean, yeah. was that, because once you start asking those, then it. Oh, they're totally open. Mm. But I also think people, like general public, I don't expect them to put those two together. If I, if this wasn't my job, if I was having hip or back pain and I went to a PT and I was having leaking or other things, I, I wouldn't put both of those or even That's think so to ask, oh, could those be related it isn't that I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable offering up that information. I actually think it's more just the lack of knowing that they're related. Totally. You would think that's just a doctor. You go see a urologist or something. Right. It's not even the same. That totally makes sense. No. And so then if you think about, too, like physician training, they're also not being educated on this. So when patients are bringing up these symptoms, even with urologists, even with GI specialists, even with gynecologists, which I argue those are the top three specialties in addition to the orthopedic docs, but speaking more to like who you would kind of think should know at least a little bit more of the pelvic floor muscles. And that isn't even being included in the education for gynecology, urology, or GI. And so if they don't then have any training on this, when patients are coming in and sharing some of these symptoms, the only tools that they look at are, okay, well, let's maybe do an MRI to make sure there isn't anything, you know, going on. But if if it's a muscle problem that's not a tear or anything like that, an imaging like that is going to come back clear. Mm -hmm. Or they're like, oh, okay, well, you're having some symptoms. Let's give you some pain management. Or if we have like overactive bladder or whatever, like we've got some pain, we've got some meds for that. But why are we having these symptoms isn't being addressed? Or the over dismissal of these symptoms when patients do bring them up to these providers because of their lack of education, they sort of dismiss them. 
where they say, oh, well, you know, yeah, that's kind of a normal thing that just happens to people maybe after they have a baby or at certain parts later on in their later decades of life, because something that appears common may be then kind of disguised as normal. But just because it's common doesn't mean that we should be saying that that's just part of the normal process of being human. We need to figure out, hey, that's a signal from the body saying something's not move- working well. And so then if the general public is going to a physician who's supposed to be the director of referrals and who they should be seeing, then you start to see where the breakdown of the appropriate provider to have on someone's team to be identifying these problems and to give supportive solutions versus just deal with it. Have you been able to talk to many like gynecologists in town to kind of like bridge that gap? So it's been challenging unfortunately. And when I first started back in, you know, 2014, 15 and things, I found that I wanted to spend my time in the community and connecting with other providers who were offering more of this sort of holistic care model. Because I found that we were all more willing to lean into each other and learn about what each of us were doing and how we could all collaborate to support health and wellness in our community. It was really challenging the few times I tried to reach out to some of the other physicians in this area, just because A, it's it's already difficult to kind of get in contact with them, just the way that the system is set up if you're not in the system. And then also the overload of their workday to then be able to connect with someone who's not in the system. And there's just a lot of challenges there. I will say now at this point, since I've been in the community for a while, there are a number of those providers who have learned about me through patients. And so there is a little bit more communication. Yeah. yeah. And I've actually had some of them, you know, reach out after the fact to be able to better understand. And some of the newer providers in town have been much more open to connecting out of the gate. And that's been really cool. So there's evolution happening. um, And I'm grateful for that. And then I also go, hey, I look at our medical system often encouraging people to have to be their own healthcare advocate. So then let's give them better tools. Let's help them have a better understanding of their pelvic health baseline and what questions they should be asking their providers so that they can get the care that they need because they're going to have to advocate anyway. Yeah, it's, it, you realize why it's so cool, podcasts and just information that's out there. There's a lot of information you have to filter through it, but when totally. you get something like this, somebody could listen. Yeah, yeah. I'd be, I talk about this so much. You really have to be an advocate for yourself mm-hmm. because things will just, especially physicians, I mean, everyone's really rushed. They don't have much time totally. with you. Yeah. You can come into it with some information and trying to research your own symptoms and then be an advocate for yourself and ask, right. is there a pelvic health physical therapist in yeah. town that I can go see? Totally. It's going to it's gonna put some pressure on that position, I think, to learn about. They might not even know there's such a thing as a pelvic health physical therapist. Totally. You know, so. Yeah, when I was working, there was no, like you said, there was no one in town who did this. Have you found that there's more people, like how many, just in Santa Barbara alone? So we have a a much bigger network now. So when I was doing, you know, my first course, all that kind of stuff, I did quickly after that with better tools to know how to search for a provider, realized, oh, we have two pelvic floor PTs on staff at Cottage Outpatient PT, which is our local hospital. And then also at Sansom, our other kind of adjacent medical system. But when I Googled, that doesn't pop up easily. So the general public, once again, access to searching to try to find one. I was like, I had to dig for that Mm -hmm. and work hard to find that. So again, ease of access back in 2014. And so from when I started and kind of branched out to do my own practice in 2015, after deciding like, okay, I want to do this. And the clinic that I'm at can't support this type of, you know, specialty with private rooms and all of these pieces. (laughs) I don't work in an open space. Exactly. (laughs) So, you know, it was also another catalyst for me to decide, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try to create my own opportunity here to support the community in this way and see how it goes. And I will be in practice for nine years in April. So I'm super proud and excited and grateful for having been brave enough and my patients pointing me in this direction. But yeah, now it's beautiful. We have, you know, myself in private practice and there are five other PTs that are also in private practice. And then we still have the providers at Cottage. There's two, sometimes three, depending on um, maternity leave and part-time, full-time status and all those things. And then there is usually about one to two PTs on staff at Sansom. 
So for our size community, that's actually decent. a decent amount, but I still argue there's not enough of us. Uh -huh. Um, well, that's everybody's grown a lot since, you know, 2014, 15-ish. Like you said, everybody's got a pelvis. So right. that's not that many providers, okay. actually. Like, yeah. when you think of how many orthopedic PTs there are, yeah. you know, and even people have a hard time getting in there. I mean, it's right. like two-month waits. Yeah. What would you say, if somebody's in a community, because I know the actual number of PTs who specialize in this is so small in the country compared to, like, orthopedics. Yeah. How would you find someone? Is there, like, a way yeah. to... I remember, I think maybe you mentioned there's a search or something. So there is an online directory, and the website for that is called pelvicguru.com. And you can actually search by your city or your zip code. It doesn't have every single provider, but it has a large majority of us in the directory. So you can easily search. And that was created by another pelvic health PT, Tracy Sher, who um, recognized that, hey, it would be really nice if we had an easy way to sort of direct people in the general public to be able to find providers um, or for providers like ourselves who are educating the community and different cities to be able to more quickly direct people in this way of, okay, well, so how do I find one then? Um, so that's been a really huge asset to us as a profession and being able to kind of direct people there. Um, so that's usually a place that I will, will share with the general public or when I'm doing community outreach kind of similar to like this to be able to direct people. Um, it's also listed on my, my website and I also have kind of a blog there that says, Hey, here's some helpful questions to interview a potential clinic and a pelvic floor or pelvic health provider to see who's the right fit for you. Because even for pelvic health, there are a lot of subspecialties underneath that, just like sports and orthopedics. It's like, okay, well, some are shoulder specialists, some are hip specialists, some are, you know, different things. So within even pelvic health. We have some that there's some specialty. Yeah, exactly. And what are the most common things that people are coming in to see you for? For me, so again, I I focus on you know women's pelvic health, and so for me, I'm treating across the lifespan, but I especially you know enjoy prenatal and postpartum care a lot, and that was really where I kind of started in terms of what sparked my direction to go into this field. And then as I've been here longer, I also now really am starting to reach into that kind of peri and postmenopause chapter of life because I argue that's the next big place where there's a huge amount of uh, people that need care and a significantly big area of underserved part of the population. And again, a big lack of education amongst providers. Um, but I also kind of have swung the other way kind of earlier on in a woman's life too, kind of, you know, through early 20s and things like that and addressing some of these pelvic floor symptoms that pop up even in earlier points in the lifespan. So I think if people kind of know about their pelvic floor, we often kind of associate it just with pregnancy and birth. That's one very specific chapter, but it's not the only one. Or people assume that pelvic floor symptoms only happen during pregnancy or after you've had a baby. They're much more common then, but that's not the only time that they come up. So also realizing that like my my focus has kind of started to spread in each yeah. direction. Yeah. I mean, I remember when I was talking the other day, like sometimes with the hospital, like you go to one of those classes we went to when we're having kids. I would imagine you might say a bunch of other extra things that would probably be really helpful. So when I'm helping someone through their prenatal period, it can be from a few different angles. One, to address pain and symptoms that they're having anywhere in their body, but low back, hip pain are super common. Pelvic pain, let's say around the pubic bone, tailbone, anything down below, lots of different challenges that can come up. Also, you know, incontinence, leaking, whether that's urinary or fecal or pain with intimacy that starts to pop up during the season. So just like us as PTs, okay, we're having symptoms, so let's figure out why and address those things so that we can continue to, you know, feel as comfortable as possible while we're growing human. And also to be able to support, hey, what things are helpful and safe for me to do in terms of movement? Because that's a huge chapter of a woman's life where there is a huge lack of good information about how should I be exercising if I want to be exercising during my pregnancy. And often people are sort of given that like, well, you know, just do what you've always done. Mm -hmm. But your body is doing not what it's always done. <laughs> it is totally different, yeah. And that's also assuming that what you were doing before was working for you yeah, no. or helpful for you. Yeah. I mean, we're making a lot of assumptions out of the gate, right? Mm -hmm. Or the super unhelpful like, oh, well, when you get to this X number of weeks, stop doing these things. There's no, no nuance to that. Yeah. And so, again, like being able to be an expert in that space to be able to say, hey, 
The good news is that there actually is not a list. It's actually how are we moving and how well does our body have the capacity to do X, Y, or Z? And can we still do that well, even when we're growing a human? Yeah. If we have enough strength and coordination in the system, yeah. If we don't, maybe we need to adjust or modify. But we shouldn't have to just wipe things off the list. That kind of black and white is not helpful. And I argue it creates a lot of fear. And so a lot of people then, without good information, they usually swing towards, well, I don't want to hurt myself or my baby, so I'm just going to not. Be sedentary. So then we set women up to be deconditioned often through their pregnancy. That doesn't set up anyone well for pregnancy where we're adding a lot of additional and different load to the system. And then postpartum, we have to go through a, a chapter two of, you know, letting the body heal and recover. And so there's some deconditioning again that happens there. And then we're often clearing women at six to eight weeks, regardless of how their birth went. And then again, giving them the one liner, ease back into things, listen to your body. So there's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot like orthopedics with some surgeries where it's like there's just this time for recovery that right. isn't really based on function or strength no. or impairments. It's, no. I was just thinking, um, so when somebody comes in, say they're in that prepartum period. Yeah. And they're wondering, they're having these questions. Would you do sort of like a, I imagine you must do almost like an evaluation to determine what things they are okay to participate in. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Just like we do as PT in general, right? It's like, okay, well, you know, let's check range of motion. Let's check strength. Let's have you do a few functional movements so I can see how's your body organizing. Also, how does that feel for you? Cool. Let's make some adaptations or, hey, I'm noticing, yeah, we do need a little bit more strength in these particular areas. I'm also doing a lot of education around, you know, breathing mechanics because our diaphragm and our pelvic floor work together and communicate directly. So the diaphragm and how we're breathing there has a direct influence on the pelvic floor and how it's sequencing. And so then you put a baby in between that, <laughs> and that starts to change how that communication goes. And so most people were never even given education to know about their diaphragm and the pelvic floor as the baseline, to know that that's actually like this piston inside of our torso that's regulating pressure and sequencing then our abdominal wall and the spinal muscles to give our body support for movement. So I'm doing a lot in terms of education, assessing these pieces, and then going, all right, how do we set this person up for success, both in terms of empowerment around knowing about their body instead of fear-based recommendations around movement, and then also helping to educate them on, hey, we need strength work during your pregnancy to support all of the changes that are happening in your body, and that you are not fragile being pregnant, you're growing a life, and your body's adapting in all of these incredible ways you are far from fragile. Mm -hmm. And you also need some support that's different during this time period because of the changes that your body's going through. And then in addition to that, taking into account what movement do you like? Let's keep movement going for you in these different ways and let's make it work with you rather than kind of these black and white rules. So I do a lot also kind of on the, the proactive preventative side. People don't have to be presenting with symptoms to come and seek a consultation or guidance. I actually support now quite a few people through their pregnancy on a prophylactic basis, mm. which is really rad. Yeah. And then we have people that are feeling more confident and comfortable to move all the way through their pregnancy. And then I also do a lot of birth prep education. So that doesn't replace childbirth education like a lot of the other you know classes, but I'm going through, hey, let's think and talk about how your hip you know, range of motion and mobility could impact your pelvic floor flexibility for a vaginal birth? Do we have a lot of tightness on one side or both that's then going to make it really hard for your pelvic floor to be able to yield for that pushing experience? Can we start to address those things early on? And I'm usually seeing people around week 32 to 34 to start addressing these things and working on them if they are not already a patient. And then providing you know, mobility exercises and different things to address those pieces going over different pushing type techniques, again, that diaphragm to pelvic floor relationship, helping them to understand how to use their breath to facilitate lengthening rather than this contraction against the pelvic floor when we need it to yield. And then also doing a lot of education of different birth positions and helping them to figure out what could be helpful for them when they get to that point. So again, empowerment in terms of information, empowerment about how their body and moving and their breaths are all really vital tools to support them through that whole journey and how, again, they can use that information to advocate for themselves 
to be a better listener in their body to know what they might need and to also significantly reduce, if not mitigate, significant pelvic floor tearing that often happens. And then the postpartum chapter. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, just hearing it coming from a musculoskeletal person yeah. is so different, but it makes so much sense. I mean, right? Looking at things like hip range of motion and learning how to breathe properly so that you aren't tightening your pelvic floor. And right. All these things that are not talked about at all in the typical yeah. getting ready for birth class. Like that stuff's just not covered right. because those mm-hmm. it's nurses and things who just aren't trained in the musculoskeletal right. system. So totally. it's uh, so many. In- but do you feel like, say you have that person who's looking at it as sort of like a prehab, kind of like, in, you know, just like getting ready for um, the birthing process. Yeah. Is it, obviously there'd be a lot of, potentially could be some mobility things to work on like totally. you're talking about. Do you yeah. think that it sways more towards kind of motor control and strength, like learning to coordinate those different muscles and strength related, or is it? kind of split half and half mobility and it's both yeah 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 you can't yeah yeah i wouldn't i i hear you on that totally <laughs> totally yeah and also i argue both even more so because of mm. the fact that when were we ever introduced to that part of our body mm-hmm. so i'm also teaching people hey there's this really awesome part of your body and it's too bad that we can't see it super easily like we can see our bicep mm. yeah But like I obviously use models and different things to like help them to create a picture in their brain of what this looks like so that we can then build body awareness to know what's actually going on down there. So to your point, like coordination, you know, proprioception, being able to sense what's happening in their body and also in different positions, gravity and not kind of helping them to figure out what helps them first connect with that and to feel successful there and then helping them to build that awareness in different positions, just like we do with totally everything yeah. <laughs> in PT, right? It, it, when you when you start to kind of peel back the layers again, you're like, oh, the application this, of this is no different. Yeah, it's still PT. It's yeah. Uh, so what about can I ask you Kegel exercises? Like yeah. that's everyone just talks about. That's all you hear. Like you're gonna go up pelvic floor and pelvic health. Yeah. Like, oh, just do some Kegels. Totally. How much are you really mm-hmm. doing Kegels and or recommending them, teaching them? And if you are, like, what's some I don't know. What are some cues? I don't, like what? Can you yeah. go into a little more detail on Absolutely. that kind of movement and exercise? Absolutely. So yes, Kegels are kind of the the catch all. Or if you were like take a random sample of somebody across the street and you said, okay, like pelvic floor, pelvic health. What do you think about? And like most people would say like Kegel. Yeah. And yes, a Kegel basically describes a contraction and a lengthening of the pelvic floor. And do I use that in assessments and things to look at, hey, what's that baseline of strength for this person? Also to look at what's their coordination. Can they manually contract it? Can they manually lengthen it? Is there some challenge in one or both of those directions? Also, can they sequence that while I'm asking them to coordinate different breathing mechanics? So looking at not just pure can they squeeze and hold, but can they squeeze can they release can they also do this with a couple of more complex tasks i use palpation Mm -hmm. but some clinics will have a biofeedback machine that will have kind of a a wand that they can insert intravaginally or interrectally depending on what part of the pelvic floor we're assessing and so for me i use my hand gloved and then doing that in different positions with patients depending on what we're assessing and looking at and so based on you know the kegel do i prescribe that often to be honest no and here's why A Kegel in and of itself, learning how to just squeeze and let go, does not train the brain how to use that in real life movement. So our pelvic floor is part of a specific group of muscles that are more in that anticipatory control. Anticipatory meaning that our brain is anticipating that we're about to move. And so as we start to do that, that pelvic floor will then respond based on that. We're not supposed to be manually telling yeah. it, squeeze as I take this step and move forward, right? It's an automatic thing that just happened in a healthy state. Right. Yeah. So if we're just telling someone to do Kegels to solve any pelvic floor problem, which is very common in terms of what people are recommended, if at all, A, I have yet to have a patient who was told to do that and also taught how to do it. Okay, So the percentage of people doing them incorrectly is really high Mm -hmm. and can actually perpetuate pelvic floor symptoms. Okay, The other piece of this is 
a pelvic floor that's having difficulty contracting and lengthening, I go, that's happening because one of its neighbors or more is also not working optimally. If we set the pelvic floor up in a position to be successful, she will respond. So I go, hey, I'm assessing that to go, what's the baseline? What's going on? Where are we having difficulty? And then I'm going, what movement needs to be happening better around the pelvis and also at the rib cage for that pelvic floor to show up? So when I'm working with my patients, I'm like breathing. Yeah, I was going to say, so breathing could be like hip movement. Hip mobility. Yep. Helping them to also, with breathing, going, how are we breathing? Are we doing a lot of accessory breathing through like lifting of our chest? Or are we getting really good 360 degree expansion through the rib cage? Most people have a lot of limitations in terms of being able to expand through the sides and the back of the rib cage. And when that's not happening well, we start to pitch our rib cage upward to make up for that. The impact of that then is that our pelvic floor now is put in a less optimal position to respond. So then we start to get symptoms or we have difficulty coordinating down there. But I argue if we're just telling somebody to squeeze and do Kegels and we're not addressing what's going on above and below, we're not fixing the problem. Yeah, the whole kinetic chain yep. kind of aspect. How totally. many people, like, would you have people, I would imagine this could happen, where you might have pain nearby yeah. Say in your lumbar spine, somewhere else near your pelvic region, your hip region. Yeah. And then will people have any sort of reflexive tightening of their pelvic floor in response to surrounding? 100%. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Totally. Like a guarding like you would have anywhere else. Your muscles might guard. And... Exactly. Or even like on assessment, I'll have someone contract their pelvic floor and it brings on their hip and their back pain symptoms because there's this like increase in coactivation that happens with that. Yeah. Or they think they're connecting their pelvic floor and they're tucking their pelvis, they're squeezing their butt, they're squeezing their inner thighs, and they're like holding their breath to try to generate that. And I go, okay, cool. I see what the coordination pattern is here, right? And then going, all right, now we got to unwind that because we're trying to use every other large muscle to make up for the pelvic floor and we actually don't know where our pelvic floor is and it can't actually contract because everybody else is overpowering it. So it can go either way. The other thing with Kegels that drives me bananas is also the fact of like, you know, I hear the suggestion of, oh, like, just do a few hundred Kegels a day because we have any symptom down here. And I go, okay, so why is that acceptable as a recommendation when if we had any type of shoulder pain and told people to just do a bunch of bicep curls and like see how that works in a couple of weeks? Yeah. <laughs> everyone would be like, this doc is totally bananas. Totally. I look at those and I go, that's kind of a similar recommendation. The shoulder has, has multiple directions it needs to move in. We've got 17-ish muscles that attach to the shoulder blade alone to all the various places. So if we're just being like, yep, just do curls. <laughs> we'll get better, yeah. Like, and also, how is that going to apply to whatever functional movement you need to do? Mm. Is this the only movement you need to do with your arm all day? Most people, probably none. We need to train multiple directions. We need to train what's the position of your rib cage. How are you, you know, achieving that overhead reach? Do we have the strength in multiple directions? Like all of those pieces. So wait, so if somebody has, so you might not always give someone Kegels. Hardly at exercise, all, actually. But you will assess their ability to turn on their pelvic floor to contract those muscles. Yeah. And I remember you told me, which I thought was so cool, that most people do it in supine, like you're laying on your back, right? Mm -hmm. That's you, like one of the standard ways okay. that we're taught. Yeah. But the fact you said the other day, you'll sometimes you'll do it in a gravity dependent position, totally. which makes so much sense because yeah. that's where your pelvic floor is working. Usually you're standing and... Most of my patients are having symptoms in vertical. Yeah. They're jumping or running or something. Yeah. It's a vertical. Totally. So, you know, they're... I would say treatment and recommendations for evaluations and things like that in pelvic health has been evolving just like we would hope for every medical profession. And so, yeah, when I was first taught, everything was lying on your back. And that does give us at least some helpful information at a baseline. And then I'm always like, hey, I want to see also how this person is coordinating in vertical because what I'm seeing in a lying down position does not always mimic then what happens in vertical. And then for my patients too, I'm usually saying, all right, can we can we get some information here in vertical? And then I'll often give them some weights and different things and I'll have them load and squat and see what happens when we're actually carrying something. Because again, real life. And with a lot of my patients, they're usually having symptoms or different things during exercise or when they're trying to lift something. 
whether it's an item or a kid or whatever. So I'm wanting to say, hey, well, okay, let's see what's the strategy, what's going on. So I can also better guide them and also to help encourage their understanding of their body. A lot of people also have really poor confidence in what they're sensing. And so they often look to me like, yeah, I don't know what's happening now. What do you think? And I go, all right, I, I gather that information. I'm going to ask you to do the movement again. I want you to notice what you feel first, and then I will tell you what I notice. And helping them to build that body awareness is just as important to me instead of just telling them. So I have them feel again. I have them try it in a few different ways. And then I share with them, yep, that's what I'm feeling. Or, okay, I'm noticing this. Let's try it this way. And helping to build that body awareness, that confidence to know so that then when we are doing other movement together, they can better sense what's actually happening. And also when they're at home and practicing and doing all those things that they also feel like, hey, I can assess myself as I'm going and continue to bridge that relationship together. So many questions. Yeah. It's so far, it's, uh, it's sometimes you want to have a real person here or a real case to yeah, talk through. Right? But okay, so I just want to go. So if you're not always giving Kegels. Yeah. I would what, imagine, am I, what am I giving? You, yeah. Well, I would imagine you're finding lots of other impairments that are driving changes in the pelvic floor. Totally. So it's like they have a hip mobility issue or they yeah. have a hip strength issue or they have a lumbar issue or they have a breathing issue. Mm -hmm. So you're Usually saying like, yes. all those, <laughs> everything. Usually, yeah. Makes me think I have a breathing issue. I'm always I'm always elevating. I think I'm a neck breather. I got to do, I'm not expanding. Um, so if you, so it sounds like with a lot of people, if I'm, if, is this true? If you're addressing, sometimes if you address all those other things you're seeing, mm -hmm. then they will get. They will be able to tap in better to their pelvic floor and have better control over it. The pelvic floor, for the vast majority of cases, symptoms there are being driven by a neighbor nearby. Hmm. Unless we're having a, a direct trauma event to that area, I go, something else needs to move better. And something is not strong enough around the pelvis. And so the pelvic floor symptoms are a response to that. So again, going like, are we putting a Band-Aid on where the symptom is or are we addressing the primary root of the problem? I know. Mm -hmm. I just, I literally thought most of the time it was just an activation strength issue of the pelvic floor. Yeah. And a lot of people, I think, would make that assumption if you have, you know, the education, especially that we do as PTs. Mm -hmm. Well, it makes a lot of sense. It makes me think so much about all the research on transverse abdominis and multifidus and these other anticipatory feed forward yeah. things that fire in these studies you they put EMG on and peop those muscles turn on before your arms or legs move. Yeah. It sounds like the pelvic floor is like that. If, if like, I wish that and hope that some of those studies, as we evolve with research, should also That's evolve to put EKG, or sorry, e EMG. the EMG, yeah. Yeah. Uh, like sensors, like, and assess the coactivation of the pelvic floor with the multifidus, with transverse. Yeah. So if you, and I think in a lot of those cases, we've kind of moved away, almost like what you're saying from doing these isolated, I mean, sometimes you'll do isolated deep stabilizer you training. Start there, totally. right? depending on what's going on. But some of the studies now are like, if you just get the, clear the other impairments, those systems will come back online. Bingo. So yeah. it sounds like this is very similar. I just It's completely similar. It makes a lot of sense when you think about it that way. But for yeah. whatever reason, I think because of the lack of education, I just thought of the pelvic floor i've seen studies tying it to diaphragm and transfers of dominus and the multifidus but yeah. i still in my mind just didn't loop it in with the how you think about treating those areas totally. i think because it's just not talked about it's not studied it's not no. talked about it's like yeah it's part of it but that's about all we know <laughs> hey no totally and i was in that camp until i've been in this camp for a long time and i'm like you know, as much as I want everyone to know about pelvic health, I also understand that, like, it's a deep dive just like any other part of the body. But to your point, not to overly simplify what pelvic health, you know, is, but truly if, if we can improve movement around the spine and pelvis, pelvic floor is happy. And if we're just addressing her and we're not addressing the rest of the things going on, she can only make so much progress. Or I argue she gets blamed a lot for the problem. When I go, is she really the one that is the problem or is she just sending the message that there's a problem? I go, more often than not, it's the messenger. So now my job is to go, who, who needs help? The other analogy I give is like, all right, we got a soccer team, right? 
if we have the MVP on the soccer team as your pelvic floor, and we're just sending her to practice and workouts and making her do all her Kegels, but then on game day, we need everybody to show up, meaning all the hip muscles and our abdominal muscles and our back and our diaphragm, but we're not having them go through practice, but we put them all on the same field for movement, how well do we expect that team to function? Yeah. Not that great. Yeah. So what I think what's interesting, so say you're an ortho or the PT listening to this. Yeah. And you have somebody who comes in with lumbo pelvic region symptoms, and you're going through and checking spine and hip and all these areas for these impairments. Yeah. How come the pelvic floor person doesn't get better? Like what's, there must mm-hmm. be something unique that you're... What, what changed? Because yeah. you came from ortho and then went to this. So what yeah. were you not doing back then? Yeah. Was it just more awareness? I don't More awareness and education. Huh. I think too. Like the person has to be aware of what's happening there. I mean, both, both yeah. clinician oh, yeah. and yeah. inpatient. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think that there can be a lot of overuse of the bigger muscles. And so we can keep strengthening them and them, you know, in testing, getting stronger, but we're still having pelvic floor symptoms because we still have a coordination issue. Right. As as one example. So like I mentioned earlier, like if we have a when I have my patients that are just squeezing their glutes, tucking their butt under, squeezing inner thighs, holding their breath, all these kind of things to do certain movement. That means that they may be strong in those areas, but we don't have good strength and coordination at the pelvic floor. Yeah. Or in the sense of, you know, maybe we are addressing those, you know, hip things and um you know, the the core stability exercises, but is someone bracing and holding their breath and not getting good excursion of that diaphragm to talk to the pelvic floor? No matter how many deep core stability exercises we do, if we're not integrating that into the training, I argue there's only so much progress that can be made. And often you'll still have low back issues. You'll still have hip pain at different points or with different load. And often it's like, oh, there's still this mismatch between how the body is creating this stability or distributing it in other places. And the pelvic floor will often get overloaded easily because there's no other place to easily relieve pressure inside of the torso if we need to. So... You don't kind of push out. Yeah. yeah that intra-abdominal pressure, that's where it goes. Exactly. The easiest place for it to go is through the front and also down. And then add gravity on top of that. Do you have any tips for, I mean, I'm in a, you know, a lot of my friends all just said children. Yeah. Uh, and incontinence is so, so common. Mm-hmm. Is there any tips you can give people that they can do on their own? Or are you saying now, now I'm feeling like it's so specific to each person? Good question. So first and foremost, yes, leaking is normal. Or sorry, le- <laughs> leaking is common. And that doesn't mean that that should be a normal for the rest of someone's life. We, we often mix that up. Even I just did it. Saying that, oh, common equals normal. And that, yes, incontinence, especially urinary incontinence, is super common after having a baby. And a big reason I would argue that that is true is because of the prevalence of pelvic floor tearing in the delivery. And then also a huge lack of education and postpartum support to guide healing and recovery and restoration of strength like we would have for any other major major medical injury to a muscle. Yeah, you just have this, like, weakness. Do you have a, I mean, you had some of that compromised tissue integrity, and then you have no intervention to rebuild that. Right. Other than just ease back into exercise, listen to your body. Well, wh- where's, where's the guide? I don't, like, what am I listening for, first and foremost? So to answer your question, okay, so leaking is really common. One of the big things is, yes, there, it, ideally I would want everyone to have an individual assessment, but that's not possible. But one of the big pieces I will often encourage general public to think about is going, hey, n- notice and try to incorporate breathing while you move. A lot of people start to hold their breath without even realizing it <laughs> while they're lifting stuff or a toddler or whatever. And that actually creates challenges for that pelvic floor to respond and or to kind of overload her and cause that leak. So exhaling with exertional tasks, they both start with an EX. So that's a a mnemonic device I often invite my patients. Like blow before you go, blow out as you are moving an item or lifting something to help actually invite some of that 
co-contraction of the pelvic floor with the rest of the core team. The other piece, a really big missing point is often there's a lot of hamstring tightness and inner thigh tightness that's actually holding that pelvis more in that more forward anteriorly tipped position, which is then just overloading the front of the pelvic floor, which is right where the bladder lives, which just makes it more vulnerable then when we're lifting and loading. So if we can focus on hamstring flexibility and strength into those hamstrings, also inner thigh strength. And then making sure that we are feeling good and capable with squatting and lunging movements, that those are the movements that I am working towards or incorporating with my patients to help strengthen that whole team. And these are really important functional movements when you think about your day-to-day. How often do we need to squat and lunge and get up and down from the floor and all of these things, especially with kiddos? Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at all of those movements, too, as ways to assess my patients, but then also incorporate that into their home program to be addressing these pieces. And that often starts to bring a lot of support for the pelvic floor because the pelvic floor is being supported by a lot of the hip muscles underneath. So the inner thigh muscles are inserting right along the front of the pelvis and communicate a lot with the front portion of the pelvic floor, which is what's holding underneath the bladder. And then behind, we have the hamstrings that are positioning a lot from that sit bone underneath, and they're all often really tight, especially after having gone through pregnancy and in a really shortened position. So that's also why we still have a lot of that kind of increased arc in the low back more than is ideal. So then their low back feels tight and uncomfortable all the time because we actually need more strength in the hamstrings. And then that makes it more difficult to be able to access our glutes. So by getting more length in the hamstrings, and strength, getting more length and strength in the inner thighs, and then being able to build more strength into the glutes, plus the breathing and all that stuff, we start to rebuild that foundation to address the leaking instead of the Kegels. Yeah, it makes sense. It's like every it's like you talking about it, like, oh yeah, that makes sense, but I wouldn't have thought about doing that. Yeah. So when people um so I like that exhale when you exert. So say you were bending down to pick up a kid, yeah. you'd exhale on the way up. Yeah, so I go in, inhale to go down to them, up. exhale on the way up. as you go up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then if you were thinking about adductor, hip, groin kind of flexibility, yeah. people do like butterfly stretches, like splits kind of stretches. Like what do you like or not? So you can do a butterfly stretch. I really like kind of that adductor rock back yeah. sort of position where you're kind of on hands and knees with one leg out and you kind of sit back Good one. towards your heels just to help open up some of that movement mm-hmm. and then strengthening right into it. So I really like kind of, you know, some standing kind of banded mm-hmm. adduction work is one that I'll do a lot. Playing with kind of lateral lunging motions, you know, unloaded and then loading when we can. Um, I also really like kind of mixtures of like Copenhagen yeah. plank. Like all the groin strain yeah. exercises, which makes sense. 100%. Yeah. All of those are actually really awesome for pelvic floor coordination and strength because of the relationship of that adductor to the front portion of that pelvic floor to really help with connecting all the way towards the pubic bone. Because when we have a lot of tension or tightness or weakness in the pelvic floor, it often starts to kind of connect and tighten more backward around the tailbone. So we actually need more of that connection towards the front. So the adductors are one of those big co-contracting teammates. And then how that feeds up into the pelvic floor and then the lower abdominals a lot of my patients like immediately feel that connection without having to overthink it. So that's always my other piece. It's like, let's not overcomplicate the pieces. How do we help set you up into a position that you can manage? And then also setting you up into a position where you can start to feel this co-supporting team and pair it with your breath. And a lot of my patients start to already feel that improved engagement with some of that inner thigh coordination with their breathing. At least like the, I never... I was just thinking... Mm-hmm. Yeah, and all your pelvic floor. <laughs> totally. Like all the pelvic floor stuff you did. Did you ever? Um, no, no chance. Yeah. Yeah. What about, so like people can have a pelvic floor that's too hypertonic, right? Mm-hmm. And they can, so they can have one that doesn't know how to relax and they can have one that don't know how to engage. Correct. So the people that have leaking issues, they're the ones that don't know how to activate well. Is yes. that true? Can you make that statement? You can. Okay. And you can also say it the other way. And if you are, oh, if you're too tight you can't relax you also could have leaking issues Mm -hmm. oh okay yeah Uh, maybe those would just be the pain people yeah no but it can go both ways it can go both ways you really have to know what you (laughs) 
Yeah, that's where the assessment comes in. That's where the assessment comes in. This is also where I go, you know, not to, again, overly simplify, but I think breaking it down in this way to help people understand. Um, a functional muscle anywhere in the body is one that can fully contract and fully lengthen because we need full range. And that also then means that we have good strength and coordination through that full range. Any muscle that gets stuck somewhere, sure, is not going to have as much strength, but is it truly because of that or is it because it just doesn't have the coordination through the range? Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, but we still need full range in order to then build full strength, right? So if I have a pelvic floor that's too tight, I argue it's also in need of strengthening because it's just stuck in that contracted position. So I need to work on helping them figure out how to lengthen it. And often me just telling them to lengthen is not going to fix the problem. That tension is being built because it isn't getting enough support somewhere around the pelvis. So we got to address that. And then if we have a pelvic floor, yeah, that isn't able to contract at all, I also can't tell them, hey, just do a million Kegels because that's not going to work either. Usually they're not able to contract also because, again, there's another piece happening around the pelvis and the pelvic position as well as going, hey, what's not happening up above at the rib cage? There's got to be something there, I argue, 99% of the time that needs to be co-supported. So either situation can cause pelvic floor symptoms because we don't have efficient strength and coordination. Another analogy I give a lot is like a, a healthy pelvic floor acts like a trampoline. We have a certain amount of helpful tension at rest and just baseline. And then we need a strong pelvic floor to be able to be flexible enough to lengthen, like when we jump, and also fast enough and strong enough to be able to quickly rebound. If we have a trampoline, a.k.a. a pelvic floor that can't do those well, we're going to have symptoms. It's so crazy, right? It's like it's eccentric and concentric contractions. Totally. Like you, your pelvic floor lengthening, is it contracting? In a lot of cases, probably eccentrically and letting down. Eccentric, yeah. This is going to sound kind of messed up, but can you add weight to your pelvic floor? You can, you yeah. Can. So there are like vaginal weights really? that you can insert. Yeah. And for some patients, I do find them helpful, especially if we're having a really hard time with kind of body awareness and what we call proprioceptive feedback, the fancy word for that in the PT world. Yeah, because I was adding load helps you cue in. Yeah. Um, but this is also where I go just getting people in vertical yeah. and giving them weight, a kettlebell, whatnot, like in their hand to notice what's going on. So it's just getting them in a certain amount of loaded position that doesn't overload them is helpful enough for them to sense a difference versus being unloaded. And so, but, I mean, t t different tools to help different brains and bodies be able to understand things. So there's a time and a place. The other topic that we were kind of discussing was menopause. Yeah. This is like something that's completely foreign to me and knowing. Completely foreign to me. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you asking this question. And I will share with you, too. I was very naive until a few years ago. And if I wasn't in the pelvic health PT field, none of this would be on my radar yet. Um, so for context, I am 38 and, you know, my mom did start menopause a little bit on the earlier side. So I already kind of had like on my radar, like, oh, I should learn about that sooner versus later, but like, I'll get there. And then now I've been having more patients come in. So I've been, you know, encouraged to become more educated to support them and then also by proxy help support myself. But I think one of the really big pieces that women deserve to know as we are evolving through our life and the natural change of hormones that is going to happen kind of into the 40s, 50s, and 60s of our life is a significant decrease in estrogen. Estrogen is a really important hormone, especially in our body for a few different reasons. At the pelvic health level, when we have less estrogen available in our system, the vaginal and pelvic floor tissues get impacted. They are less lubricated. They get less efficient blood supply. There's also thinning of the vaginal wall and of the muscle tissue itself. So that means that we often start to have an increase in pelvic floor symptoms, such as pain with intimacy. We have an increase in often urgency and frequency issues with urination. We also often have an increase in pelvic floor tightness because of those things. And so this can also create symptoms that look 
like a UTI, but on urine culture will come back negative. So kind of pelvic floor tension and spasming of those muscles can recreate similar symptoms as a UTI. So a lot of women will be misdiagnosed with UTIs or the provider will be like, oh, well, maybe we just don't have enough bacteria, but like everything checks the boxes. So let's put you on antibiotics. And they go through multiple rounds of antibiotics without getting better. And now we've disrupted their GI system. So the drop in estrogen has a really big impact on urogenital symptoms in this chapter of our life. Now, the good news is, if we know this, then we can advocate for vaginal estrogen. And this is in a cream form, in a vaginal suppository form. This can also be orally with hormone therapy that's prescribed, again, by a physician that understands the nuances of this, as well as an estrogen patch. And all of this, just like any medication, needs to be appropriately dosed. But using these tools in addition to a pelvic floor PT on your team to address, hey, is this really just a hormonal issue? Sometimes it absolutely can be, that alone. And then I'm often usually finding some other things that would be better supported also in terms of hip strengthening and coordination, all of those pieces. And I'm also often educating my patients in these chapters of going, hey, if you don't already enjoy or have a regular strength training program, we need to get on that ASAP for your bone health and for muscle longevity, because we are losing about 5 to 10% of our muscle mass from the age of 40 onward if we are not regularly strength training. So if we were already at a deficit in terms of our muscle strength going into those decades, we've got more muscle to make up for. But if we're strong enough going into those years, that helps significantly with that. We need strength training to maintain our bone mineral density because estrogen is also another really important hormone to maintain that. When we lose estrogen, then the body starts to break down bone faster if we're not doing things to counteract that. So this is why osteoporosis is so prevalent. But I argue it's because we need better education and encouragement earlier on in our later decades to understand hormone management, to have a medical system that actually prioritizes doing this proactively for women, like I would argue late 30s, early 40s, as well as strength training being part of our movement education, not just cardio. And so that plus helping women to understand that they need to also seek out a medical provider on the physician level that is actually specialized in peri and postmenopause. The typical gynecologist does not have that in their regular medical training. It is birth and pregnancy specific. So there is the menopausesociety.com that has a directory there that you can search for those providers who are menopause trained and are going through that specialty and better understand these pieces. Because a lot of the hot flashes and irregularities that come up with our um, exercise tolerance and uh, a lot of issues with blood pressure challenges and heart rate irregularity for us women during these years are directly linked to the hormone changes. But they're getting missed or they're just put on blood pressure medication, but like we're not again addressing like what's the root cause here. And then there's a lot of other mental health layers of this too because of estrogen and the link to serotonin in the brain and all the other things. So we deserve to have providers on our team that understand these pieces. We also deserve to be given more information in my opinion on the front end as we go through life, but also as a as a pelvic health provider, I'm counseling my patients on all these pieces because I'm usually the first person that's talking about all of these pieces with them. And then helping to triage with them of like, hey, here are other providers that would be helpful for you to consider to bring on your healthcare team. There's so many things we could, you could go on for like eight hours about this. 100%. But, um, we'll do other episodes. Yes, yeah, so we can do more. I want to just ask on the estrogen though, would that yeah. be a, that's blood work, totally. right? Totally. What you did, when you, we did a big comprehensive panel, did you, did they measure that in your? No, they did. It's in there, I think. Yeah, so it'd be regular blood work. You just have to ask, maybe a more comprehensive. Yeah, you have to ask for a more comprehensive panel. You need a more comprehensive panel in the sense of our hormones are literally fluctuating on the day. We're not as steady as you all. Mm -hmm. So we, again, need a specialist that understands this to know what day in your cycle we should be testing you to get a better understanding of what's going on, to then be able to make recommendations. Gotcha. And then like anything with any medication, we're going to need to make some adjustments to figure out the dosage that is most helpful for each person. 
Opie just did say she wanted to do like a blood panel. So yeah, she'll probably know when to order. And know. double checking still in that of like you know breaking out your thyroid into all of the layers, not just general TSH. Also looking at vitamin D, iron, and ferritin, because these are other things that can contribute to you know the fatigue or just you know feeling like I'm not recovering as well you know between workouts or good sleep or fill in the blank kind of cluster of symptoms that a lot of my patients will be describing to me when they're coming in with these other pieces too. Yeah, blood work is so huge. We went so long without doing a really good panel. Same. And then, and even the group we hooked up with, I think they're more male focused. So it'll be kind of interesting. I mean, it was a really, all the things you're mentioning yeah. were measured, but yeah. which, because both of us are in early 40s, so we were having energy issues, just noticing drops of energy. And, totally. But I think it'd be interesting and to look at that, like when that, what, you know, thinking about where you are in your cycle and when yeah, you're getting that. We do it like day 21, but I don't know. I don't know how sort of then. Yeah, typically it's supposed to kind of be like day three to five after your period. Mm-hmm. To kind of take a look at those things. So let me ask you one more thing. Mm-hmm. We're, yeah. We'll do more episodes. Yeah. I I like to, um, I always think this is helpful at the end. This is your specialty area. Is there anything else you would think to tell to a listener that we didn't ask you about? Hmm. Or something you can even read. It. If there's something you want to go back to, just to reiterate, yeah. I feel like you can jump. We, uh, my brain can jump around a lot in these really? conversations. So, yeah. is there anything like, yeah, anything you would say, anything extra, or something you would really highlight from before? Yeah, I think that one kind of piece that I am wanting to kind of impart on people around pelvic health is that your pelvic health it should be considered another vital sign of your health, just like we're supposed to be measuring and checking in on our blood pressure and our pulse and our temperature and our body weight, right, when we go to see the doctor. Noticing how our body is able to control bowel and bladder function well is a vital sign. Our ability to, you know, feel comfortable being sexually intimate is another vital sign. And also our ability to move well through the day and through movement and not have pain in and around our pelvic floor is also another important vital sign. So if any of those vital signs are not feeling optimal for you, don't ignore that. Go seek out support in that and connect with a pelvic floor PT to help you unpack what's going on. Because our pelvic health, in my opinion, is such a big indicator of someone's quality of life. When we lose the ability to control bowel and bladder function, that significantly impacts our day-to-day. When we don't feel comfortable to be physically intimate with our partner, that also significantly impacts the quality of the relationship. And then also, if we can't maintain good movement throughout our lifespan, that's also going to significantly impact our quality of life, both with you know, adventures and enjoying of activities, but also, again, I argue, spending time with the people that we love. So your public health matters and deserves to be supported. And it's never too late to invest in your pelvic health and to learn about this part of your body. I love it. Thank you. That's so helpful. I think just highlighting even kind of those broad categories of symptoms and how they relate back to quality of life is so helpful. I think if I were listening to this, it's like, oh, I can think about kind of these different things and that could be bothering me right now. And, right. and like you said, if you had one of those going on, I can imagine how much that would just affect your quality of life that would yeah. be such a it affects so many things so it does that dep- mental, mental health, health component, yeah okay, that would come from that oh my gosh so, jinx yeah yeah totally like hearing those things yeah. is amazing so yeah. um chris thank you so much for coming on i think that's super helpful we'll have to do more and we yeah. can every time we have some conversation i'm like oh you could go into so many the weeds on so many more things yeah. but this is amazing i think for people getting that kind of base a lot here but kind of baseline whether you're a practitioner or you're a patient what should I be thinking about in this area? I know it helps me a ton going back to ortho and just like yeah. there is somebody that has something that's not getting better in that region or maybe there are, maybe it is motivating to me maybe to ask about other symptoms in the pelvic floor and maybe like if it feels embarrassing to give them a piece of paper and yeah. maybe it's part of the intake where you're not asking if it feels awkward at first, but just yeah. do you have any problems with any of these symptoms? So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you want some, you know, brainstorm on how to ask some of the questions, yeah. let me know. Yeah, good <laughs> but yeah, I think that it would honestly be really helpful if, you know, sure, these are intimate questions. But I think that the fact that we don't talk about these is what makes people not be able to get information about this either. Yeah. And so I think we need to normalize 
the activities that we'd have to do multiple times a day. Yeah. Like, let's not make it weird. Yeah, it shouldn't be so awkward. Right? Just be talking. Yeah. And so if we as providers can also make it more normal and to feel more comfortable to ask these questions, I think it also invites more openness and conversation to want to discuss those things and to appreciate what that feedback in our body is telling us about internal systems and how that can be another piece of the puzzle when they're coming in, especially with symptoms like we mentioned of low back and hip pain, especially. That should be part of the intake because there's an absolute connection there. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. We'll have you back again. Yeah. Thanks for having me.